Okay, so moving right along then in uh, John David Ebert 101, uh, the next topic I want to cover is uh, Oswald Spengler and Jean Gebser and philosophies of uh, grand meta narratives of history. <clears throat> grand meta narratives uh, generally have been delegitimized uh, after World War II, starting with the French postmodern thinkers who come in, uh, Foucault and Derrida and Deleuze and Guattari, and they delegitimize uh, grand meta narratives. Uh, since they, to their way of thinking, this is precisely the way of thinking that led to the atrocities of the war, especially with the Nazis and their sort of collective racial ego inflation um, that it led to. So, uh, however, they're wrong. Uh, the, the, I do not, I like a lot of postmodern philosophy, but this aspect of it I just simply toss out as rubbish. Um, it's gone. And in hypermodernity, grand meta narratives are making a comeback anyway. So the madness of postmodernity and its nihilism will turn out to be exactly what it was, a, a passing fad. Um, you absolutely have to have grand historical meta narratives in order to make sense out of history. Otherwise, you wind up with this grade school approach where history is just a jumble of disconnected dates. And if you can't remember this or that date, too bad for you, you're no good at history. It's all about remembering dates. Well, the way that you remember dates is through organizing them in your mind through morphemes. Uh, they have to be organized uh, morphologically uh, and collected together into living organisms. Otherwise, you don't see the big picture. And so with Spengler's Decline of the West, which was published in two volumes, volume one, 1918, and volume two, a couple of years after that, uh, 22, I think. Um, so with that, Spengler gives us a uh, what he calls a morphology of history. That term he has borrowed from Goethe, the, the term and the science of morphology was created by Goethe. Goethe looked at everything morphologically. There's a morphological way of looking at biology. There's a morphological way of looking at history. There's a morphological way of looking at even geology. Um, it has to do with the study of forms and their organic internal consistency. Um, it's not just a collection of raw data as, as your average archaeologist or your average historian thinks that it is. It is not. The data is worthless if it is not organized into patterns, into morphemes, uh, into figures that confer on it uh, synthetic unity. And so, um, so Spengler looks at civilization and he divides it into um, nine distinct civilizations. And the first model that he gives in the decline of the West is that there are just these nine civilizations, um, starting with Egypt on the one hand and Mesopotamia on the other. Uh, the archaeology on Mesopotamia was just coming in at this time, uh, so it came in just in time for his thesis, fortunately. Uh, and then, of course, uh, with the Greco-Roman civilization, which he calls Apollinian, and our contemporary civilization, which he calls Faustian, um, and the, the uh, Indian, the Chinese, um, and uh, the Mesoamerican, the, Az the Mayan, Olmec Mayan Aztec, um, and the Russian. Um, and he says that the Faustian one, ours, the Euro-American civilization, is the only one that is still in the process of fulfilling its po morphological possibilities, whereas the Russian is the only one that is still newborn, it's still nascent. Um, it hasn't even really yet begun its civilizational cycle. Um, but then prior to this, uh, before we look at this, and this model is based on looking at these civilizations as, as sort of gigantic plants. They're like these organisms, and like organisms, they have a predetermined life cycle. Once they come into being, uh, they have a, a life cycle of about a thousand years, a predetermined life cycle, where they can go on living, like India and China do to, to this day, as these sort of petrified trees that are long past the phases of their inward fulfillment. They're just these decaying giants. Uh, nothing new is going to come from those societies. Um, they're reliving their own cliches and stereotypes over and over again, even while importing Western technology uh, and uh, catching up with the West. The rest uh, is catching up with the West. Uh, so Spengler, at the end of his career, was working on a, a sort of prequel to Decline of the West called uh, The Dawn of World History, which has not been translated, but um, the chart in it, in the back of the book, is, is if you know just enough German to make it legible, you can read it. I want to mention this first because um, it fills in the gaps with the Neolithic now. Uh, Spengler turned his attention to the Neolithic, the Paleolithic, and the Neolithic, but I want to focus on the Neolithic here, which is the period that takes place uh, 
from about 12,000 BC uh, down to about uh, 3,500 BC. That, that in there right there is all the Neolithic. And once again here, it's not just a jumble of disconnected pottery shards. Um, there are three distinct cultures that Spengler sees here. Um, and here, uh, because these are not yet arborescent cultures, to borrow a term from Deleuze and Guattari's A Thousand Plateaus, they're not center periphery, rooted to a geographical locale with a, a temporal a metabolism going uh, on the model of a giant tree. They are instead uh, what he calls amoebas. Uh, so these are cultural amoebae because they are not rooted to a particular geographical locale and they wander, they move around a lot. And there are three of them. So the first is what he calls the Atlantis culture. And by this, he does not mean that the myth of Atlantis. It has nothing to do with that. Um, he just uses the term because uh, it's connected with the Atlantic Ocean and the Mediterranean. Uh, and this is basically the megalith building culture, the, the culture that winds up in Ireland with Newgrange and goes all the way down across uh, North Africa on into Egypt. And it is a heroic culture. It's based on hero worship. Um, and uh, then the opposite culture is what he calls Kash, which comes from the, the zone of India and migrates across the Persian Gulf, up the Gulf and into Mesopotamia. And where these two amoebae cross, and Kosh is a priestly culture. It, it builds uh, temples, not um, megaliths and star-oriented monuments. It, it builds uh, temples, and it's priestly in its orientation. Um, and so, when these two culture, these two cultural amoebae cross in the Near East, we get the birth of high civilization. Now, the third culture doesn't come in for a while yet. The one in the north. Uh, is called Tehran, which is basically the Indo-Aryan horseback riding nomadic culture that extends all the way across from the Caucasus Mountains, the Black Sea, and then all the way across, uh, maybe as far as China, or at least the edges of it, like the Taklamakan Desert. And uh, that doesn't come in until later. So we get then civilization up and running, uh, first with Egypt on the one hand, Mesopotamia on the other. These are the two giants. But then we get two smaller scale societies with Harappa, in India, which comes in about 2600 BC, and uh, Minoan and Crete, uh, which Spengler sees as, a, as an, a satellite society of Egypt, uh, and perhaps Harappa, which is just around the corner and up the Persian Gulf from Mesopotamia, could be seen as a satellite civilization of Mesopotamia. And this term now, uh, satellite civilization, I have borrowed from Toynbee. Toynbee has some useful uh, ideas. Uh, Toynbee is Spengler's British counterpart. Uh, he doesn't believe in cultural morphology, but he does have uh, an artist's touch for history. Uh, and so he creates similar models to Spengler, although he sees 20-something 20, 20 civilizations, which he calls societies. Um, so he has too many of them. But he has a lot of useful ideas, one of which is this concept of a satellite civilization. And another is this idea of three different generations of these civilizations, uh, which is perfectly compatible with Spengler because... This first generation then, which is created out of the crossing of these two cultural amoebae, uh, then decays. And long about 2000 BC, from about 2000 BC down to 1000 BC, the troubled second millennium, we get that third cultural amoeba start coming down. The, the Tehran culture, the Indo-Aryan horseback riding, chariot riding uh, uh, warriors start coming down into these aging, dying behemoths you know, in Egypt and Mesopotamia and Harappa. And eventually Minoan Crete, uh, they come down and uh, they cause a bunch of chaos. Uh, and there's a long period here of an interfusion and synthesis of these two worlds, the, the Tehran world with the first generation of civilization to produce the second generation, which then comes in across the board now, China, India, Persia, Greece, eventually our civilization, the Faustian civilization. That's the second generation of civilization according to Toynbee's model, and I think it's very compatible with Spengler because he realized later on that something very crucial happened in that second millennium that made the civilizations that came after it, which are philosophically inclined, different from the mythologically inclined civilizations that came before it. And note that that distinction will then pave the ground for our discussion of Gene Gebser and his various stages of movement from the magical to the mythical to the mental or philosophical consciousness uh, structures. Um, so then uh, the third generation that comes along for Toynbee is, is the generation of Islam, uh, the, the, our far Western Christian civilization. 
uh, and Islam, but primarily those two as a kind of third generation. Um, but for the purposes of Spangler, we only need to think about these first two generations. So each one of these civilizations has a predetermined life cycle of about a thousand years, or at least a thousand years of vitality. It may go on for a long time after that. Um, and it has a morphology of a, there are four distinct phases. You can analogize them as Spengler does to spring, summer, fall, and winter, just as the human life cycle can be analogized to such four stages. The childhood of a person is the springtime of the life. The adolescence is the maturity, the, the summer. Um, and the, the later maturity is the fall and old age is the winter. Uh, maps on very easily. Um, but the other model is the pre-cultural stage, the early cultural stage, the late cultural stage, and then finally civilization, which Spengler regards that fourth phase, the winter stage, as decadent uh, and corrupt. And the first three phases have in common an interest in art, metaphysics, uh, poetry, literature, all in the grand metaphysical style, whereas the, civiliza the civilization phase moves away from that and declines into a preoccupation with pragmatics, technology, the sciences, um, concerned with economics and politics, all of that displaces the concern for high metaphysics, uh, of the metaphysics of art and culture and poetry and so forth. And each one of these comes into being in its pre-cultural phase um, with the birth of a new religion that also brings with it a new burial style. Uh, there's a reason why the Egyptians mummify their dead and the Indians burn their dead. Um, and the reason is that the Egyptian consciousness has a will to the future. It's a, it's, a, it's a historically conscious civilization, just as ours is, and just as the Chinese is. Uh, whereas the Greco-Roman and the Indian are ahistoric. They're kind of amnesic about the past, especially the Indian. Um, there's no such thing as an Indian historian. They don't exist. And the dates in Indian art and literature are so vague, we don't even know. They kept records of nothing. Uh, 400 BC to 400 AD is the vague date given for the composition of the world's longest epic, the Mahabharata, 18 volumes there, uh, because it's anonymous and it's people, uh, pundits make contributions. Uh, they don't sign it. We don't know who made what contribution when. It's just this vague amorphous epic, although it is one of the greatest works of literature without question ever written. I've read a bunch of it, not all of it, um, but I read all of the, its sister epic, the Ramayana, which is quite a bit shorter, but still very long. Uh, and that is, mag both works are magnificent. But yeah, the dating for both of them is, is very vague. That's the Indian ahistoric mentality. The same thing with the Greco-Roman civilization, even though it invented the discipline of history with Herodotus and Thucydides. Nonetheless, um, those two authors only recount events in which they lived and participated. Anything that came before their own individual lifetimes, they throw onto the dustbin of myth. Those were the days of giants. Uh, those are the days of myth. Um, so they don't really have a historical consciousness the way the Far West does, the way our Faustian civilization does with its will to the infinite in time and the infinite in space, which is totally different from the Greek love of the small, the precious, the miniature, the sensuous, the bodily, the physical. Um, that's the Apollinean aspect. Ours is Faustian with infinite space. Each one of these civilizations has a kind of Ur symbol that characterizes its mode of orientation of waking consciousness to the outer world. And so the key thing that we want to focus on, I think, for purposes of this series is that this idea of the disintegration of the, of the culture period into the winter stage of each of these civilizations, where we then get a preoccupation with uh, technology, the sciences burgeon, as they did in Hellenistic uh, Greece, the, the Hellenistic world, the Greco-Roman Hellenistic world, um, all that you get at Alexandria becomes the primary city of learning. Uh, if you want to be an intellectual anywhere in the world, you went to Alexandria. That was the, the Paris, let's say, of this civilization. That was where you went. That was where the mind was. Uh, but this is an age when, the, let's say, from the time of Alexander's death, uh, about 300 BC, down to the coming of the Romans and the Roman Empire, right around the year zero, thereabouts, uh, that is the winter stage here, and also the Romans as well. Spangler has a useful term designating this period as a universal state. Um, Spangler calls it the disintegration into Caesarism. When the Caesars rise up, the Republican Democratic Party politics disintegrates into a series of civil wars where, since nobody can agree anymore, no, nothing can get done. I think we're headed for that now in our culture. It's very clear 
uh, that the two parties can no longer agree to disagree. Uh, those days are over. The left at this point thinks it's running the show and that the right uh, is, a, is a fiction, a non-entity. So um, it's completely hijacked the political and media landscape. Um, so the civil wars are coming, but trust me <laughs> on that. Things are going to get quite a bit worse as we devolve based on Spengler lining up these timelines so that you can make morphological predictions based on what these other cultures went through in their tail end phases. You can also then make predictions about ours. And I think they're dead on. The Americans are clearly playing the same role that the Romans played. Or that, let's say, in the civilization that Spengler terms Meiji, in the Judeo-Christian Islamic civilization, the Arabic phase of that civilization is concerned with high metaphysics. All the great philosophers date from this period. Uh, and they come out of either Baghdad or Damascus in the West. The mystics come out of the East, out of Persia, where Sh Shiite Islam comes from. That's where all the mystics and the great poetry comes from, but the great philosophers are uh, the Alpha Reb, Alpha Rabi, Avicenna, Averroes, uh, Ibn Khaldun, who is the Oswald Spengler of the Arab world, who writes the, the Muqaddimah as a, his historical survey about all the differences of the civilizations long about 1300 AD. And it's at that point that the Arabic mind shuts down about 1300 and the Ottomans come in. They are Seljuk Turks. Uh, they are not Arabs. Um, but they are Islamic, and they conquer all of Islam. They are the Romans of this culture. Uh, they conquer the whole Islamic world, and they give to it what Toynbee calls its universal state. And you'll note that it produced no great philosophers, no great poets, no great uh, writers, uh, only scientists, only men, uh, doctors, uh, medicine, engineering, all of that stuff burgeons under the Ottoman Empire, just like the Romans, just like the Americans. So there is a definite morphology to history. Don't let any uh, asshole scholar, professor, or academic tell you otherwise. They are dead wrong. Sp Spengler and Toynbee are correct. That's an absolute fact. And the same thing can be said for uh, the universal states that appear in India and China, uh, both around the same time, 200 BC. Ashoka uh, is the emperor who conquers all of India for the first time and unites it under a single rulership and he converts to Buddhism uh, shortly after doing that. Then in China, Qin Shi Huangdi of the Qin dynasty, which was where China gets its name, uh, who were originally barbarians from the hinterlands, come in, conquer all of China and unify it. And Qin Shi Huangdi becomes this traumatic figure of nihilism and liquidation. He liquidates the ancestor cults. He gets rid of all the traditional forms, introduces new currency, new standards of weights and measures, new roads, taller buildings, um, overnight, uh, he completely redesigned Chinese civilization in a nihilistic way. Everything is based on pragmatics. Note that. It's based on pragmatics. How can we apply new technologies to make things better and forget about ancestor worship? That's what the ancients did. That was for the Shang and the Zhou dynasties. They're old fashioned. Forget about them. Forget about Confucius. Forget about Lao Tzu's mysticism. These men were what's called legalists in China, and they were absolutely brutally pragmatic. They have lots of burnings of the books, more nihilism. Uh, that's their equivalent of our French deconstructionism and post-modernity, the burning of the books. Here in our civilization, uh, we love books, and we're never going to burn them because of our Faustian sensibility of preserving everything. But the equivalent of that is deconstructing all the great ideas that built our civilization and made it possible to begin with. Um, that's the same thing, the burning of the books that comes in at the tail end, the liquidation in China. Uh, we've lost so many uh, works. The, the Confucius and Lao Tzu, Mo Tzu, Chuang Tzu, all of these guys came out of what was known as the Hundred Schools tradition. Hundred Schools, there no longer exist. <laughs> so we know the name. Uh, there must have been a lot of philosophy in the time of Confu Confucius and Lao Tzu, which is about 500 BC, several centuries before this liquidation. Uh, so a lot has been lost in these. And China has had these various burnings of the books as, as time has gone by. So that's, um, in a nutshell, the, the briefest version I can manage of Spengler's model of history, which for me is fundamental, as it was for Joseph Campbell, who presupposed it and from whom I learned it. Um, and I learned it when I was 20 years old, and it's been with me ever since. I've never, in all my reading, I've never read anything uh, to discredit it that made me think, Oh, I guess Spengler was wrong, he, because he wasn't wrong. He was absolutely correct. 
And Spangler right now is going through a, a resurgence, a, a vogue of popularity. Um, and that would only be the case if he had hit on something. Uh, he fell into abeyance there for a while um, with the discrediting of uh, the disinherited mind of Germany after World War II, as it's been called. It is not disinherited. Uh, if you disinherit the German mind, there's no Faustian civilization there, as the name implies. It's German. That's where it comes from. Uh, German, Anglo, and French, and Spanish, and Italian. Uh, but the Germans are the one group in there that if you delete, the whole house of cards comes tumbling down. There ain't no civilization without the Germans. So there's no disinheriting there. Spengler went into abeyance then after World War II and the Germans lost. Um, so everybody thinks, that, oh, the Germans, they're all Nazis. No, <laughs> that's ridiculous. Uh, and so Spengler has come back in a big way uh, because people recognize uh, the utility and the value of what he contributed to history. And uh, surprise, surprise to me last year when in September I was invited to Lafayette College, which is uh, an almost Ivy League level of prestige in Pennsylvania, invited me out to give a one hour presentation on Oswald Spengler um, as part of their Mill Series program. I was absolutely floored, number one, that they wanted to hear about Spengler, and number two, that they invited me, uh, since I'm a nomad and uh, an anti-academic, let's say. I'm the anti-academic. I can't stand them. These little intellectual roaches scurling, scurrying around for every little breadcrumb of knowledge that they can add to their dust pile. Um, but yeah, I was surprised. So that's a good sign that Spengler is coming back, that the academic world is taking a second look at him. Um, and realizing, wait a minute, we may have thrown something out here that was of value. Uh, and I'll conclude with, this reminds me of Heinrich Zimmer recounts a, a tale in his book, The King and the Corpse, edited by Joseph Campbell, of a king who, uh, every day, uh, a, a monk or a, one of these wandering sannyasis would come in and give him a piece of fruit. And the king would look at the, this innocuous piece of fruit and just toss it, give it to his treasur treasurer, who would then toss it into the treasury through the window there, and then it would pile up over time in the treasury. Then one day, as the king receives this fruit, uh, a monkey comes in, bites into the fruit, and out comes a jewel. Uh, falls right out of the fruit, and the king goes, oh, hey, let's take a look in the treasury. Let's see what's in there. So they open it up, and of course, all the fruit has gone because it's rotten, and there's a huge pile of gems. That's Spengler <laughs> right there. Spengler was the gem hidden in that fruit that uh, the world of academe is now going back and saying, wait a minute, let's check the treasury here. Uh, we may have missed something. So I'll conclude with that for Spengler. And then uh, for the next video, we'll look at uh, Gene Gebser, who is every bit as formidable as Spengler. Um, and so we'll see how these two map on to each other.